Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Derek. I am a site reliability engineer at Pinterest, where I work on the traffic engineering team, and I'm here to talk about our edge deployment of Envoy. Uh, so when I first got to Pinterest, uh, rolling out Envoy as our uh, load balancer and HTTP router was one of the first things I did. Um, so it was a really fun journey. We started rolling that out in about March of this year, and as of summer, our um, load balancers are 100% running Envoy. So all requests hitting Pinterest would go through Envoy. A uh, bit of agenda, so I'm gonna talk a bit about the migration process. Um, in particular, I wanna spend a bulk of this talk talking about the subset load balancer and some sophisticated routing scheme that we did for serving the website uh, due to some interesting requirements that we adopted from our previous uh, load balancer. So a bit of background as to our stack. So we run, well, we use multiple CDN vendors in front of our edge deployment, um, just interleaved into one large coherent network. Those went to classic load balancers uh, serving HTTP, uh, sorry, layer seven HTTP, which would go to a fleet of varnish hosts, which did the path-based routing, the complex load balancing, all those sorts of things. So this is how we looked at this point last year. Uh, this stack served as well. I think it's been this way since maybe 2012, uh, but as time progressed, we started running into many issues and accumulating te tech debt uh, that it came time to rethink how we serve Pinterest. Um, so some of the reasons why we want to migrate uh, are classic ELBs were facing scaling issues. Uh, during peak traffic of the week, we started experiencing intermittent connection failures or connection timeouts uh, that we just cannot debug, cannot find out why. And it turned out that our ELB was hitting capacity limits. Um, the options AWS gave us were to either shard our traffic amongst multiple ELBs or adopt their new network load balancing um, product, their layer four load balancer. That sounds awesome, but uh, it doesn't support TLS termination, which the classic ELBs were doing for us, so that meant pushing TLS back a layer in our stack, which would be great, but Varnish does not support TLS termination out of the box. Um, the Varnish way to do TLS termination is to run another proxy in front of Varnish and terminate TLS, and then proxy the plain text to Varnish. So if we're gonna operationalize an entirely new proxy, maybe we should just rethink using Varnish. Um, there are a number of other issues too, so Varnish is a Great caching proxy, no doubt about that. Fastly uses it to run their CDN, but the path that we were serving was all dynamic traffic. We weren't really caching anything, so um, we weren't really using Varnish for its strengths and what it's meant for. Furthermore, there were some other goodies that we wanted out of our edge load balancer, dynamic upstreams, which we kind of hacked onto Varnish with this scheme where we would reload or regenerate configuration and reload Varnish every time we detected changes in Zookeeper. Um, it was this brittle uh, Rube Gold Rube machine that when it broke was terrifying to deal with. Um, the observability wasn't great. When Varnish did break, it was very hard to figure out why. Um, and lastly, uh, when we were looking for a new proxy to, or sorry, yeah, those are the reasons to migrate. So we were in the market for a new proxy, and one of the main um, options we were looking at was OpenResty, which many of you might know is an Nginx module that embeds Lua scripting into Nginx runtime. So you get a scriptable load balancer. Dynamic behavior, great. Um, we were talking to some other internal teams at Pinterest, specifically our service framework team. Uh, this is the team that writes networking code in each language, you know, the problem that Envoy is trying to solve. And they were like, hey, there's this cool proxy that we want to use as a service mesh. Maybe you guys want to check it out for your edge proxy that you're going to replace. Um, so we took a look, and it checked all our boxes that we needed out of an edge proxy. Supports TLS termination. It's high performance. It has a great extension model. Whoa. Did my computer die? Oh, it logged me out. Awesome. I hope security's happy that I have auto lock on. Um, okay, so yes, TLS termination, and uh, let me get caught up here. Okay, so we were ready for a new proxy. We adopted Envoy. That was a great fit for our stack. Um, so we went with it. Uh, some logistics of how we started to run Envoy. We don't fork the project. Any core changes we need, we try to contribute through the open source process. We run Envoy in Docker containers. Um, we do use hot restart across containers. That was fun to get working and works really well. Um, and lastly, our control plane for our initial Envoy rollout runs as a sidecar on our edge hosts. So a bit of detail about the control plane that we run. At Pinterest, we have a default um, service discovery setup where everything's backed by Zookeeper. When a host comes up, it registers an ephemeral node. Um, and we have a daemon on every host at Pinterest that will read that Zookeeper configuration and will write it to a file on the machine. So if our communication with Zookeeper breaks or network partitions, we have a local cache copy um, available. Sounds very similar to how Envoy caches EDS, hint, hint. Um, so 
the second part is the routes, clusters, and listeners, which for our edge deployments don't change very often. So for those three services, we decided to just use static JSON files on the machine. When we deploy changes to those, it's just a matter of swapping the files and Envoy's configured to watch those files for updates. Um, for EDS, the problem was simply taking those cached files of the Zookeeper data and translating it into API that Envoy understands. So we wrote a little Go sidecar that just sits next to the Envoy machine and feeds the data to Envoy over those APIs. So to get complete feature parity with Varnish, we had a list of things we had to satisfy. Um, most notably, there was, so the routing schemes and request manipulation, that kind of comes out of the box with Envoy. There wasn't any work to be done there. Uh, one of the more sophisticated features we had to do is uh, CDN request signing. So since we use multiple CDNs, um, the CDNs will sign the request with an HMAC and forward it to our proxies, and the proxies would read and code the HMAC and verify that, okay, yes, this request came from a CDN. Since we use multiple CDNs, uh, this was the best solution we had. Um, in a simpler world, we could just have an IP list of known IPs for the CDNs and just say, have a security group that says it has to come from these IPs. Um, but we don't live in a simple world, unfortunately, so um, this is an adaptable scheme to however many CDNs we onboard in the future. Uh, we also have to do bot detection. Our SEO, comp or SEO team within Pinterest are heavy clients of our team. They want to know when is Google bot crawling, when is Facebook bot crawling, are we giving them 500s, are we giving them 200s? Um, so we did a bit of legwork to write up a filter that builds off of the IP tagging filter to identify bot traffic pretty reliably. Um, since it's an edge proxy, we have to do access control, recognize uh, whether the request to pit to Envoy is an internal request, whether it can access certain services. And lastly, what I'm gonna be talking about for the bulk um, half of this talk is fronting an AB deploy at Pinterest. So at Pinterest we have one service that is AB deployed, that's our website, www.pinterest.com. Um, I'm gonna dive into the requirements then a bit after we cover these things. Yeah, so, bold. Uh -huh. um, there were a couple migration hiccups along the way that I ran into. Uh, Envoy has a configuration to handle X forwarded for for you and detect client IP addresses, which is great if you know how many trusted hops you have in front of you. Um, in our case, we have multiple CDNs and they make no guarantees about how many trusted hops there are. Uh, so we adapted our CDN request signing mechanism to also proxy the trusted client IP address. Um, sometimes the trusted hop would be one, for some of the CDNs it'd be two. Um, so we couldn't rely on a static number there for trusted hops. Uh, we also learned the hard way that uh, Envoy by default is conservative about circuit breaking. When we were first running Envoy and it was pumping about 1,000 RPS compared to Varnish, which was pushing out six or 7,000, we were wondering what we were doing wrong. Uh, it turns out that by default, the upstream circuit breaker limits at 1024 if you don't specify anything. And since we live in an HTTP one world, it's one request to one connection. So we were effectively limited to 1,000 requests upstream um, until we realized that we were missing a configuration option. Um, hot restart across containers took a big, bit of work to get going since uh, for hot restart you need shared memory and shared networking space. Um, that was pretty easy to do once you have the Docker configurations to share the memory space and network uh, space. And then along the way we learned a lot of services don't quite respect HTTP the way you want them to respect HTTP. Uh, we found a service that was using a library whose header parser was still case sensitive. So when we put HTTP in front and lowercase all the headers, that service broke. Um, there was another fun bug where an older version of Finagle or some buggy version that we were using, uh, if the response was empty, it would put two content length headers in the response, um, which if you read the RFC, it says uh, you can either collapse them into one header or just call the request invalid. And from what we can tell, Varnish was perfectly fine with it, but when Envoy jumped in front with Node's HTTP parser, it would start rejecting all those requests, which mostly were health check requests. So these services just started failing health checks for no reason. Um, that was a ton of fun to debug, not really. So just a bunch of really fun, interesting ways um, that things can break. When you replace a north-south proxy, you learn the hard way that you have a lot of inherent dependencies that you don't know about, so it's critical to try to get as close um, on par functionality as you can. Even if you think, eh, this isn't gonna make a difference, someone downstream is depending on that. Uh, I think they call it Hiram's Law of Software Engineering, that anything that is observable, people will depend upon. Um, so getting everything as close as possible is critical. Okay, so jumping into A-B deploys. So with the website, www.pinterest.com, we have this requirement that when a user starts their session on Pinterest, 
they continue to see the same version throughout their browsing session. Pinterest is the kind of application where people don't check it every five minutes. They typically sit down, pour a glass of wine, start scrolling through boards of interior design and gardening and recipes. It's a very meditative, therapeutic process. Um, so we want to make sure we don't disrupt that throughout their browsing session. So once the user starts their session, we want to keep serving them the same version, even if a deploy happens. We don't want that deploy to disrupt their experience. So the way that this has historically been solved is uh, every web machine has two versions of the website, an A version and a B version. And when we, deploy, um, when we deploy the website, it goes to one of the versions, and the user can still access the old version uh, through a request header that the browser sets or our JavaScript client sets. So that B version is still available, and then once their session ends and they come back onto Pinterest, then they get routed to the new version that has been launched. So we're running these two versions at all times, uh, which has been fine. Um, and then, okay, so to route to these different versions, we use the subset load balancer to do so. Uh, we attach the version as an endpoint metadata, and the request sends the version header that comes in. And so we wrote a little glue filter called the header to metadata filter. So if you have seen this in, in the core and wondered what the heck is this for, we use this to solve the problem of matching request headers to endpoint metadata. Um, yeah. So yeah, that, we contributed that up. Um, however, we put Envoy in front of this uh, AB cluster and something interesting happened. CPU usage jumped up to 100%, almost 100%. Um, and the worst part about this is that this was the last deploy group we were trying to get of Envoy out. We had like three successful deploy groups go out. This was the fourth one, the main one, dub, 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 here we go, and CPU skyrocketed, so we had to take it out and do a bit of homework into what's going on. So we ran perftop on Envoy while it's fronting this deploy, which perftop is a wonderful way to get to know a new piece of software. And we saw this, uh, this function, this update function, taking up 86% of CPU time. Um, and if you look three lines above that, is I think it says cluster update membership or update membership cluster. Uh, huh, okay, so what's going on here? So we did a bit more diving, and the, the caveat of having the AB deploy work the way it was, where we have two versions on every machine, meant that however many web hosts you have, double that, and that's actually how many uh, endpoints Envoy has. So however big the, the fleet was, double that, and that's how many endpoints. Um, and a fleet of that size is constantly experiencing health check churn. Hosts are dying, hosts are launching, auto-scaling kicks in, a deploy happens, that causes health checks to churn. And at that scale, uh, what you're doing when you update the health check is that Envoy has to not only update the cluster membership, but when you use the subset load balancer, it also needs to update all of its subsets and keep track of who is in what subset, who is still alive, et cetera. So this constant, continual churn uh, was really pegging the CPU, and so we had to come up with a better way to do this. Um, downsizing the fleet is not an option, unfortunately, so I forgot how to, how to make this work. So my teammate, Raul, uh, came up with this process that we call health check coalescing. The idea here is to batch deliver updates of health check membership. So I think this is on by default now in Envoy, but essentially you can configure Envoy to say, um, check the membership status every one second or every three seconds rather than having it constantly happen. Because we didn't need sub-second granularity on cluster membership. We just needed a general update at least every couple of seconds. Uh, this dramatically fixed our CPU problem and we were ready to go. We were ready to launch Envoy. Um, so the AB, the AB deploy process is not perfect. Uh, we've had a number of incidents uh, caused by this AB deploy scenario. Um, yeah, this is probably my favorite Slack quote yet. Uh, we had one really bad incident where instead of being an AB deploy, it was an AA deploy, which is like the equivalent of undefined behavior in our deployment world. Um, and it turns out that undefined behavior means machines break in fantastic ways. So we needed a better solution. And now that we had Envoy in place running our website, uh, we thought we had the building blocks needed to come up with a better, more robust, and scalable solution. So uh, these are the constraints that we had to abide by in our new deploy scenario. We still had to pin users to a certain version. Um, that couldn't change. The model that we were going for was what we call staged deploys, stage-based deploys. Essentially, you divide up your clusters into stages, so canary, staging, prod, the usual ones that you're all probably familiar with. Um, and each stage should have a version, right? And 
handling this stuff by default in Envoy is pretty easy to do. It's pretty easy to map version, production, uh, whatever, using the subset load balancer and the metadata. But the caveat is pinning users to your particular version and, um, and stage. So, OK, cool, not getting ahead. Um, actually, let's jump in here. So the way that we solve this is we have the endpoints all, um, we have the EDS served, which has the stage and version. Those all go into Zookeeper, and the sidecar process will pull this down and generate your regular EDS. We then came up with something called a route map. The route map is a map indicating how many hosts are available to serve each permutation of stage and version. Because we could say that we want to target sending 20% of users to version A, but if only 5% of the machines are serving version A, we might accidentally overload those machines. So we also want to make sure we're not sending too much traffic to a particular permutation. So the sidecar generates two artifacts, the EDS, so that way um, the subset load balancer can do its matching, and also this route map, which gets consumed by a filter we wrote. So what the filter that we wrote does is whenever a request comes into Envoy, if there's, it'll try to sign it a routing ID if one does not exist. This is just a unique identifier, so that way when this, this user comes back, we can send them to the same version and uh, stage without having the flap between anything. The, the filter then collects the capacity measurements from the um, route map, which I forgot to mention is injected by runtime data. Uh, so this, the sidecar, as I mentioned, it's a sidecar, it sits on the host, so it has access to Envoy to directly pass it runtime values. So the filter will read those runtime values for the capacity and then compute where should this request go. And then at once all those computations are done, it's just a matter of setting the metadata on the request and then letting the request go on its merry way onto the subset load balancer to get matched. And then of course, since we're having a filter in here, it's a great place to put in some custom metrics so that we can see what the decision split is, um, how many requests come in that don't have a routing ID at all, um, just some good metrics to keep track of. So kind of to explain more explicitly the interfaces that we have. So we have the control plane, which receives input from Zookeeper and produces the two, um, two outputs, EDS and the route map, which has capacity. Then the filter just consumes that route map, runs a computation to see where it's in this request, and then applies the metadata of the request and lets the subset load balancer consume the endpoint discovery service and do all the heavy lifting for us. So the amount of code it took to implement this really wasn't that much. I think it was only a couple hundred lines of Go and C++ and majority of that was unit tests. So the subset load balancer provided a great building block to build complex routing schemes. All we had to do was set the metadata to any um, flexibility that we needed. So as I mentioned, uh, so we had to go with this custom solution. So Envoy has a feature in it called uh, it? subset localities. We can set the weights per subset, which works great if you want to do traffic distribution on a request by request basis. But as mentioned, we have this uh, constraint of pinning not just requests to a certain version, but users. Um, so we found that the localities, uh, the subset locality weights didn't really work for us because it would shard traffic and could potentially flap users between some requests go to a certain stage, some requests go to a different stage. Uh, we wanted to keep that experience uh, cohesive for our users. Uh, lastly, my probably my favorite part about Envoy is how many metrics it emits. I did a, a quick little measurement. I think it's something like 1,300 metrics out the box for uh, one of our deployments. It's fantastic, my favorite thing about it. Uh, these are some of the things that we alert on. Uh, we have the basics like high CPU disk, those, those come from just a T-collector module that's uh, querying the system metrics. And then we also learn a variety of failure cases. Um, these are, are very helpful for diagnosing issues in production when things break, why they're breaking. Um, and fantastically, on-call is very quiet. Envoy is a very reliable piece of software, as Matt mentioned. Um, what's great is seeing other people's reaction to how much observability we have. So Envoy by default has metrics on a per cluster basis. That's something that's practically new to our edge tier. So the fact that we can see, oh, there's a spike in 500s, exactly which upstream caused those 500s, uh, that has been fairly revolutionary for our SREs. Um, and we even added a little Envoy emoticon to Slack. Um, so looking to the future, so we have Envoy running 100% of our edge deployment. We are looking at the service mesh scenario. Our case is a little bit interesting because we are a thrift shop. 
And not only are we a thrift shop, but we have multiple dialects of thrift that run within Pinterest. So figuring out how to get all those standardized and figure out how to get Envoy in a way that can support all those permutations of functionality uh, is going to be a fun challenge. We are looking at the possibility of integrating memcached in some way, maybe as a network filter. Um, and we're keeping an eye on the MySQL and Kafka filters very closely as we are heavy users of those systems. And with Envoy at the edge, we're looking at moving a lot of our um, authentication and authorization functionality out to the edge and doing everything there. Um, that requires looking, doing look aside requests to other services in Thrift, so we'll still need to build that Thrift foundational work, um, but we're excited to push that in this coming year. Um, that was everything I had. I think I spoke a little fast, but I have plenty of time for questions. Uh, thank you. Yes. Multiple CDNs with what? So this is particularly the dynamic path. So all of our static content is served out of S3 directly. And so uh, we just use multiple CDNs to optimize for availability and performance in various parts of the world. Um, yeah. Yes. It was mostly operability and reliability. Uh, so uh, he asked, what was, the, what was the end user impact of running Envoy at the edge? Um, so there wasn't much in terms of user facing things, like users didn't necessarily know like, oh, Pinterest is running a new load balancer. Um, it, it was mostly for our own engineering delight in that we had better observability, um, things broke less often when they did break, it was really easy to debug. Um, we had a very powerful control plane that was very flexible and enabled us to dream up of any complex interaction that we needed and Envoy could do it. Um, the control plane provides a very powerful puppeteering API, I like to think of it, um, so mostly for um, operability. Yes? Yes, he asked what the tool was for diagnosing CPU usage. We just used perf, and perf has very sub uh, tools like perf top. Um, if you use Brent and Greg's flame graph tool, that's an excellent tool for visualizing uh, CPU performance. Yes. Great question. So we have two different deployments. Our main, de so he asked uh, if we expose Envoy directly to the internet. Uh, most of our deployments are fronted by a CDN, who we implement the request signing with to verify that requests are going through the CDN. So for the most part, it's trusted traffic. We do have one deployment that does face the open internet. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? On a security perspective, how we decided it? Yeah, um, so from a security perspective, for the internet-facing one are you talking about? Uh, yeah, so the internet-facing service just has a history of not being fronted by CDN um, for a number of reasons that um, it's, it's a logging endpoint, and um, so, yeah, there were, the security of that has been, like, before my time, that's kind of how that service was always run. Um, we have experienced certain things like sin flood attacks that have tried to happen, um, and those scenarios all went over quite well. Um, we didn't experience an outage due to those. Yes. Yeah, so the question was if we use AWS to load balance multiple envoys. Uh, so we have one NLB per envoy deployment, and each deployment consists of N envoys. Um, so yeah. Yes. Great, so the question was how routing changes were expressed. So in the previous world with Varnish, we were having VCL. It was kind of up to traffic engineers to make the changes on behalf of other people because those route tables grew so complex. And there goes Autolock again. Um, 
And so with the change to Envoy, essentially what the migration consisted of is I would take the VCL and just do an enumeration of what are all the features that Varnish are doing and implement them into Envoy as a checklist. And now that the routes are expressed as JSON files, it's very easy for other engineers to go in and understand what's happening and make the changes themselves. So we, for now, routing changes, it's just up to engineers to submit a pull request, we'll review it, okay it, and deploy it. Cool, I think those are all questions. Oh, yes. Yes. On the, on the instance itself? So the question was if we did any DOS protection on the Envoy instance? For the, yeah. Um, we, we have that as a hard set uh, sized group, so it's susceptible to DOS, but um, we have firewall rules to prevent that. And uh, yeah, I'm not too familiar with that deployment, so I can't speak to it in great detail. Um, but we have done a bunch of failure testing with Envoy in terms of uh, what happens if it runs out of CPU, runs out of memory, auto scaling constraints, et cetera. Great, thank you. <laughs>